Tonight, we ride! That's all. Awesome. Aaron Mando, you've been warned about using bioelectricity in group before. Welcome back everyone, it's Charlie. This will be my full Marvel She-Hulk episode seven video. There were a whole bunch of Easter eggs and references, so we'll break it all down. If you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the episodes and careful for spoilers for the episode if you haven't seen it yet. We'll just start at the beginning and work our way through shot by shot, talking about Easter eggs and WTF moments. And the other cool thing that they actually just confirmed was a big Wolverine Easter egg during a previous She-Hulk episode. Like there was this reference to a man fighting someone else with metal claws in a bar in my video for that episode in particular, I called it a Wolverine reference just because it felt like a Wolverine reference to that first X-Men movie back in 2000. Or it was a scene like that, like he had a similar bar fight like that, and it was Wolverine, like the Hugh Jackman version of Wolverine, because now we know that he's going to be in the MCU because Ryan Reynolds just released the video confirming that Hugh Jackman would come back as Wolverine in Deadpool 3. But we did have one idea. Hey, Hugh, you want to play Wolverine one more time? Yeah, sure, Ryan and they confirmed that it'd be canon to the MCU. Now, obviously it's gonna be Deadpool, so it'll be super meta and they'll get super weird with it and he'll probably make all kinds of jokes about the multiverse and timelines, things not making sense. But I do believe it's meant to be the versions of those characters that we've been seeing in all the Fox Marvel movies. So make all the jokes about Deadpool killing the Fox Marvel universe in Deadpool 3 that you want to. And speaking of mutants and X-Men characters coming into the MCU, we saw another mutant character show up during this episode. The El Aguila character is a mutant, and they have this whole joke in the episode about him being torn between his two different identities, trying to find out who he really was. That's meant to be a comic book reference because in the comics, he pretends to be a sword fighter like a swashbuckler, as he joked about during this episode, when really he just does that to hide the fact that he's a mutant. And his big mutant power is to create electrostatic discharge, which he does in the episode when he uses his sword. But the actual episode title was The Retreat, which is a reference to the Abomination special retreat that he started as a sort of new age zen that he's teaching to the other Marvel villains. And most of these villains are Daredevil and Punisher villains because obviously Daredevil in the MCU now, Punisher also probably gonna come back pretty soon too. I think that them using Punisher villains is just a hat tip for that. They also say that that Punisher villain Saracen is a vampire and I think that's meant to be another reference to the Blade movie that's coming up like it's meant to foreshadow that and everything that's going on with Jen and her She-Hulk blood that they're trying to steal through the Intelligentsia because he spent the entire part of his episode referencing stealing people's blood. Like we should go drink his blood. He's just trying to get your blood, which literally is happening. Like he literally calls out the episode like, oh yeah, that he just wants to get your blood. So that was just like the other big reveal of the episode is that Josh is working with the Intelligentsia in this Hulk King character. Hulk King is a reference to Hulkling in the comics. That's like another alias that he uses, but Hulkling is actually a scroll. He's like the scroll emperor. But I actually think that the leader of the Intelligentsia might wind up being a version of the leader because he's going to be the main villain in Captain America 4. So I think they'll have some references to that. His whole thing during the Incredible Hulk movie is that he was trying to take the Hulk's blood. Like he had all these samples and he was trying to do all this research into Hulk's powers. And he's also the person who turned Abomination into Abomination using Hulk's blood. And the Intelligentsia is a comic book villain group that the leader and MODOK were both part of. I don't think MODOK is going to be in this series because of the way they're using him in Ant-Man 3. And I believe it's going to be like a big twist on the character during Ant-Man 3. So I don't think that has anything to do with this. Really cool side note too, the Intelligentsia in the comics were the ones who created the Red Hulk. Like they're the ones that turned Thunderbolt Ross into Red Hulk. They kind of implied in previous episodes that the whole idea is that they want to take her blood so that they can use it to create more Hulks. The actual episode starts with Jen getting out of the shower, texting Joss, setting up their whole relationship. Apparently he's using her to get that gamma blood, like I said, so he's basically reverse honeypotting her. In fact, they even foreshadow at the very beginning of the episode, like this opening scene, when you're looking at his text to her, he's been trying to find where she lives. And she's like, wait a minute, you know which neighborhood I live in? That's like the most sus thing of all. Like, oh, that's clearly something a stalker would do. Then they have a long montage of their relationship over the course of the week. Like they go on a bunch of dates and you see her having a bunch of different text conversations with him as their relationship develops until they eventually bone at the end of the week. Turns out that was his whole goal so that he could clone all the data on her phone. Also during her meeting here, because she's in the superhero law division, and that's probably what they're talking about here, whichever case they're working on, when the person says the insurance policy covers acts of God, I think what they're saying is that they're trying to liken a supervillain attack, like some superhero's powers, to the act of a god. Which might be a Thor reference, because like there are gods in the MCU, we saw them during Thor Love and Thunder. But when you think about them treating gods being on Earth as a normal thing, usually you think about the Thor character. 
The whole thing with her getting the Lawyer of the Year award in the gala that Nikki mentions is something that they'll probably pay off in the last two episodes, maybe like the finale, because there was some trailer footage of her at the gala with this big attack where she has to hook out and save everyone. That also might be part of the Daredevil episodes. I don't know if he's going to be in one episode or two episodes. I believe next week will be his first episode if he's in two, but he could just be in one. When they dropped the first trailer, they hadn't revealed that Daredevil was confirmed to show up in the series. So the fact that there was so much red coloration and red lighting in the trailer just made everyone think, wow, they're probably trying to foreshadow Daredevil showing up. You notice during their text, he uses lots of emojis, which itself seems kind of weird to begin with, but also it's meant to set up the end of the episode where they reveal he sends all those emojis to Hulk King about stealing her blood. She uses the term Hulk smashed, as in Hulk's catchphrase, Hulk smash. When Nikki is speculating on all the things that Josh could be doing that would keep him from sending her text, she suggests silent retreats, which is meant to foreshadow Abomination's retreat, which is the whole title of the episode. Also, we find out the reason why he hadn't responded to her is because he was only trying to get into bed with her so he could clone her data, and he had no reason to contact her after that. He didn't actually like her, so it wasn't like he wanted to talk to her. She practices yoga, she watches a Muppet movie. The Miss Piggy Muppets clip she's watching on her phone is actually from the Great Muppet Caper movie, which is an awesome classic Muppet movie. It's like one of the better Jim Henson era Muppet movies. But the Miss Piggy clip is also meant to be a metaphor for her, Jen She-Hulk, because in the scene, Miss Piggy metaphorically hulks out in prison and bends the bars to her prison cell and frees herself. So I think that's meant to be a metaphor or foreshadow something that She-Hulk will eventually do, like the intelligentsia will get the drop on her and she'll have to save herself, like she'll hulk out and go full savage She-Hulk. When she gets the call from Abomination's parole officer, his name is Chuck Donnellan. That's actually a reference to Charles Donnellan, who's a real-life comic book artist and she travels to Abomination's retreat to check on, on him. And based on the route that she takes in and out of the retreat, it seems like it's in the Malibu area. Because remember, the whole series takes place in the Los Angeles area. So these mountains in the view of the ocean later when she's leaving seems like it's in Malibu. The area where she is is just like super expensive, which I think is just meant to flow with the idea that he's charging people out the money for his new age religion that he's teaching to people. It's sort of like a cult that he has going on here. These special meditation retreats, and those seven special women that fell in love with him basically gave him this property. When they get there, the parole officer calls her the Jolly Green Giant because she's giant and green. Abomination claims that his inhibitor was malfunctioning because he got shocked by an electric fence, but early theory is that that's a lie and he was just tampering with it and trying to remove it. Because there is some later trailer footage with him walking around at what seems like his retreat in full Abomination form. So like at some point, he'd have to get out of that inhibitor. When he says he has a favorite chicken, Princess Silkfeather, like he has all these pet chickens here, I don't know if that's also meant to be a reference to something else or another person. We'll see if it winds up being code for something eventually. They introduce the Manbull and the El Aguila character. Manbull is a daredevil villain who started as a man and was turned into a half-man, half-bull in a lab experiment, like he says. His powers are exactly what you think they'd be. And I already kind of explained El Aguila. He's actually from the Luke Cage and Iron Fist team-up comics. So like we have a lot of the Marvel Netflix characters coming back into the MCU now. So of course they're using a lot of their villains too. And because El Aguila is a mutant and they're doing more mutants now, it also makes sense why they chose him in particular. But like pretty much all the villains that are here are meant to be like C and D list villains. The other weird thing that happens in this scene when they destroy her Prius is that she specifically calls it a Prius Prime and they mention Prius Prime a couple of times. So I'm wondering if it was part of some ad campaign or like a commercial that they worked into the episode like ad integration because they do that with a lot of cars in Marvel series and movies. Like that's why Iron Man drove Audis because Audi paid Marvel a ton of money to use their cars instead of Tesla. Like normally you'd expect him to drive a Tesla. When they say El Aguila's identity as a sword fighter is a representation of all the times he's been metaphorically stabbed in the back, betrayed by people, it's a parallel for She-Hulk's Josh storyline with him betraying her just to get her blood. And when he talks about the yurt integrating the past and present into one being, that's a metaphor for She-Hulk combining the two halves of her personality, Hulk also doing the same thing, becoming the Professor Banner version of Hulk. Like they're two sides working together so that they have the power of the Hulk in their full intellect. It also kind of seems like Abomination has done a version of that too. They make this big thing about her being stuck there because her car's waiting for a tow truck. She could actually just use She-Hulk's power to jump home super fast. Like the Hulk can run fast, of course, but because their legs are so strong, they can travel even faster by just doing super jumps. Like old school Superman style, leaping tall buildings in a single bound. They have the special support group scene. You look in the background, he calls his special teachings Abomaste. 
The other new characters are Porcupine. He's actually from the Ant-Man and the Wasp stories, Tales to Astonish, but he's also shown up in Iron Man, X-Men, Captain America, Avengers comics. His whole story is that he was a scientist working with Hank Pym, and he built a power suit just like Hank Pym built his own suit, but his was a Porcupine suit, and he wound up turning into a supervillain just taking the suit with him. They use him mostly for a joke in this episode, like he's been wearing the suit for so long that he just gets super rank, which they pay off in the end credit scene, like that new extra scene of him actually getting it dry cleaned. Then Sarah Sen, like I said, is the vampire who's from the Punisher comics, which is another clue they'll probably bring the Punisher back eventually, and obviously we have vampires, more supernatural characters coming through the Blade movie. We also have Werewolf by Night that's going to be happening in a couple weeks, which is basically like a monster MCU series, like they're doing more monsters, more supernatural characters. And then S.H.I.E.L.D. breaks the fourth wall for the first time in the episode, and she also knows that she's a character in a television show, which I believe is the first time that she's referenced that. Like, this is a level above normal fourth wall breaking. She calls out the previously on, on the beginnings of most episodes, queuing up another one, speaking to someone off camera, like she's talking to Kevin Feige in real life, queue up another previously on so we can explain who this Wrecking Crew character is. And the thing about this is that, like, normally when you see people do this in shows, like Rick and Morty does stuff like this every once in a while, like Rick Sanchez knows that he's a character in a fictional TV show. When characters gain the ability to do this in stories like this, it essentially makes them the most powerful character in the entire universe. Because if you think about it, like a celestial could come attack her, get ready to vaporize the planet, and she could literally pause the universe by breaking the fourth wall and then queuing something else up. Like, okay, let's just jump to some other scene. So it's like a level beyond the meta that they've done before. They'll probably do more stuff like this when we get to Deadpool 3. And because she's probably going to come back in Captain America 4 and obviously Avengers 5 and Avengers 6, I also wonder if she's going to break the fourth wall or Deadpool might be in those movies or at least Avengers 6, will they also break the fourth wall in the Avengers movies? But we find out that one of the members of Wrecking Crew is at the retreat and now I kind of think that Josh is actually the other member of Wrecking Crew that was wearing the mask so you couldn't identify him in the previous episode. And they already confirmed in their previous episode when they first appeared that they were after her blood, meaning that they were working for the intelligentsia. So like the whole idea is that this guy is kind of lying to her during this whole retreat. Most of this though, they treat for comedy, like all the supervillains clown on her for her Josh problems, like what did you text him? Oh no, you can't do that, that's terrible. Saracen, like I said, keeps mentioning her blood, foreshadowing what's going to happen with the intelligentsia in Josh during the episode, but also because he's a vampire and he actually literally wants to drink blood. And because they're all super villains, they want to go kill Josh. Saracen wants to drink his blood and then El Aguila uses his mutant power, electrifying his sword with his bioelectricity, which Abomination calls out. And I love the idea that nobody thinks that it's a big deal that there are mutants in the MCU. Like Abomination is totally unperturbed by it. Like, oh yeah, someone's using their biology to create weird powers like this. Yeah, that's totally normal. And then Abomination launches into this big talk about being genuine, showing your genuine emotions, and it just seems so over the top that I think it might be foreshadowing for him revealing that he's really just doing all this as a front to try and stay out of prison. Like everything with the end of this retreat, she goes into the yurt, they have all this hopeful music, like all these B and C list supervillains are all cheering for her, like it's some really hopeful, cheesy moment. It just feels like they're trying to foreshadow that this is all kind of a front, it's all kind of fake. The Slot Tow Truck is a reference to Dan Slot, who's written a ton of Marvel comics. Also, the tow truck driver's name is Dan, so it's like literally Dan Slot Tow Truck. He's mostly known for his time writing Spider-Man comics, but he's also written on She-Hulk, which is why I think he made it into this episode as an Easter egg. Then at the end of the episode, they do a flashback three episodes earlier to reveal that when they boned, Josh copied all the data on her phone and contacted Hulk King, letting him know that things were proceeding according to plan so that they could eventually get her blood. Which I think just based on the timing of them paying all these storylines off will probably happen in next week's episode at some point. And because it is the Daredevil episode, I think that also confirms that Daredevil will be part of whatever this final arc is with her versus the Intelligentsia. But there's no actual post credit scene, which is kind of a bummer because they did post credit scenes for like most of the first half of the season. But in the end credit scene, like with the actual credits where they put the special art and add new scenes, the new scenes that they added were the ones of El Aguila back in college, paying off the joke where he said in college he did some matadoring, but it was all part of this drinking game that they were playing. They show She-Hulk in the yurt sweating it out with the other supervillains. They show Porcupine getting his suit dry cleaned. One of the things they haven't paid off during these scenes though is the shield file on her desk. Like the prison that we saw is a damage control prison. It's not shield. So we haven't seen any actual shield in the episodes yet. One of the other things I didn't mention in my previous video when she was getting her special super suits and they had the big Daredevil teaser with Daredevil's new suit, the person leaving her right as she was walking in with that costume was probably Frogman who hasn't appeared in episodes yet and he was a big person in the trailer. 
There's still an alarming amount of trailer footage that we haven't seen in episodes yet, meaning that it's in the final two episodes. And also, like I said, there's abomination footage with him in full abomination form, which we haven't seen yet, which they'll probably pay off in the next two episodes. So that means there's going to be more abomination in the series. And I think we're all expecting some sort of post credit scene teasing Captain America 4 or like some big movie because there's so much Hulk stuff happening in Marvel Phase 5. We also know that Bruce Banner's Hulk is coming back too. That's why she called him in a previous episode like, hey, Bruce, I'm wondering where you're at right now. Hopefully they'll have like a concrete enough teaser. They'll give us enough information to guess on what it is they're going to do with him next. But if you spotted any other Easter eggs in the episode that I didn't talk about in the video, just write them below in the comments. Like I said, Daredevil episode next week, my video will post after they release it. And also they released another Deadpool 3 Wolverine teaser. So I'll do a new video for that too. Everyone click here for my Deadpool 3 Wolverine trailer video and learn what's going on with him coming back. And click here for my House of the Dragon episode 7 video. Thank you so much for watching. Everyone stay safe and I'll see you guys in the next one.